Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know it's been a long day, but we have something very special for you in a few minutes. But this is the time you must let me indulge. <laughs> Ray Anderson this morning said, unless someone leads, no one follows. Maybe the role that I have taken in putting this summit together may well be the role of government. It may well have been the role of the business sector. Nevertheless, it wasn't being done and I've taken the role to do this. And I, I really felt that it was a leadership role that I was taking here. And I have to say, I'm absolutely, totally thrilled with the support that I've been given. I've been acknowledged for putting this event together. I have worked for a year. I haven't been paid to do it. There have been some incredible challenges. But I'm not the only pioneer, and there are so many people involved in this that you must give me a few moments to thank some of those people. But firstly, I'd like to say that none of us would be here if it weren't for one person. <clears throat> Is Sharon Jackson in the room? Yeah. Two years ago, uh, two and a half years ago to be precise, I took a little bit of time out to have a look at what was happening around the country because I could see this new emerging area in Australia and I was hearing terminology that was not being reflected. It, it, was, it was rhetoric, basically. There was a lot of talk but no action. People were talking about a licence to operate and corporate governance and they were sort of using these terms. CSR wasn't a term that was being used. Sustainability has been around for quite some time. But people were using these terms and it's like, I want to go further and discover what's going on and I really want to know who the educators are and who's really doing best practice in this country. So I searched high and, uh, far and wide for some time and I was very fortunate to have discovered Sharon Jackson who'd been coming to Australia at that point for about a year running leadership forums in Tasmania. I happened to go to Tasmania and on that particular occasion we had a group just of change agents. Often in a forum like that there may have been a number of corporates or it may have been all corporates. But this was a group of all change agents. And I think when you're a change agent, you can't just go along to something, hear words, and go away and do nothing. So we decided at that particular um, forum two years ago in November that we would put together a conference. And I have to tell you, when someone raised that the most important and the best way for us to, to raise awareness was education and through a conference, I literally wanted to make myself invisible. For those of you who know me, you know that I get things done. <laughs> I have taken on some big challenges in the past and um, I'm very proud of many of the achievements that I have. But it, literally at that point I did want to make myself invisible because I know when you work with a committee of people, you're often the only one who's doing the work and no one else had the skills and resources to be able to put a conference together. So we as a committee came together to try and actually make an event happen. It, the first time round, we didn't quite get um, off the ground. It was, you know, we were um, wanting to do something too soon. Anyway, we did have an event set for March this year. The tsunami came, we needed to postpone it. And literally, um, I have uh, pretty much been uh, running this event uh, on my own. There are some people who were involved in that original summit uh, or forum in Tasmania, and Brett Cohn is one of them. He's presenting um, in the environment stream on Thursday. But Sharon has been an incredible catalyst for probably more change in this country and more education in CSR in this country than anyone else. No one else has been coming in really and providing the education. She, and she has been bringing people like David Grayson to Australia. David's been to Australia a few times. So I would particularly like to acknowledge Sharon. <clears throat> Sharon also, um, apart from being that catalyst, was responsible for all the incredible people that we have here from the UK. So. And, and people have asked me, why so many speakers from the UK? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is because the UK now have CSR legislation. We have several parliamentary inquiries going on. We have much to learn from them. But they've been doing it for many years, and they're doing it extremely well. Some of you may have come across business in the community here in Australia. There are some of their great initiatives that are being developed here in Australia. So there are many wonderful things that we had to learn from the UK people. So. Sharon, thank you so much because if it weren't for you, 
we would not be here right now. So please put your hands together. And this summit wouldn't have been possible. You know, people are acknowledging me, but there are so many people who've been involved in putting this together. Professional public relations were my very first partner, and that happened over a year ago. And they have been so instrumental in so many ways. They were involved in getting the Australian Industry Group together as supporters for this event. That was so important to put this as a serious business agenda. They've been involved in the design. The man hours that they have put into this have been incredible. They have shown true leadership again in an area. We are pioneers and it's been very difficult to get media recognition. It's been extremely difficult to get media recognition. And the amount of business people that have just come back and said, you know, please don't send me any more information on CSR because it's not relevant to our business. I mean, there's a lot of shocks that we have to endure. And we are all pioneers in this room. So it's not just me. I might be paving the way, but we're all out there together. Uh, on a journey and we'll talk more about that journey over the next few days and certainly as we finish at the end of the, uh, the forum on Friday. So to the Australian Industry Group who have really helped make this a business um, issue and taken it um, from being light and fluffy to being something that's serious and it's a must have, thank you very much. To the Australian Centre for Corporate Social Responsibility, tomorrow we're going to have a great half day uh, workshop. Uh, I know many of you in the room will be there for it. It's, um, it's a great opportunity to really get hands, down, hands on and, and get down and dirty to understand a little bit more of what CSR is all about. So thank you so much for the contribution that Leora um, has made along with James Chisholm from Canada. There have been a whole range of things that they've been involved with, so we're very grateful for that. Probably the thing that has saved my life in the last few weeks has been Company D. Um, D Cameron and, and Dominic Britton have pulled together all of the technical components. So to them, a huge, huge, huge debt of gratitude. There are a whole lot of players. Higher Intelligence, we're going to be using their computers tomorrow. They've uh, graciously given us computers down there for the Internet Cafe, for those of you who haven't been online and need to. The service is there for you. Um, CSRY, this event has been actually broadcast. You'd be surprised how much email inf um, or how many emails that I've had from overseas. There's an enormous amount of interest on, on what we're doing here in Australia, but people are so impressed with, with the program and um, it's fantastic that we've been able to take it so far and so wide. Um, Interface, very grateful for having Ray Anderson. Was he fantastic or what, huh? He's sensational. So to have him open was just fantastic and they're here for the next few days and he talked this morning about um, his book Mid-Course uh, Correction. Uh, they actually um, have copies if anyone is interested, they're giving them away. So please if you're interested in reading a little bit more, uh, they'd be delighted to chat to you. So many people have made this happen. Focus Press um, have done all of our printing. Um, KW Doggett Fine Paper have provided fantastic paper and it's all been environmentally products. Um, we have um, a wonderful lady here, Chris from um, uh, Urban Fresh Services. She's an environmental print consultant. She's going to be talking in the environmental stream on Friday. But um, here we are, you know, we've, we've made sure that we've, in the first lot of printing we did, it was recycled paper and all of this stuff is from certified forests. Um, you know, it, they're all accredited mills, so there's some, you know, we've really tried to sort of cover off on everything that we're doing and there's been some great supplies to help us along the way. There have been many, many, many professional organisations who have all, also gotten involved. So to all of you, I'd like to thank you very much for the marketing support we've, you've given. This is the first event. A lot of people are saying, well, where next? Well, the reality is it's up to you in terms of where next. And I'd like to ex for you to be thinking in the next 24 hours, what role would you like to have in this industry over the next 12 months? Because in this room, we've now all committed ourselves on one level or another by being here to take CSR a little bit further. So come Friday, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on what role you'd like to play and where we can really take all of this. A very late comer to the party, very, very, very important role as far as I'm concerned is a company called Viacorp. We always wanted to webcast this particular event and we wanted to do that because we wanted to take it far and wide and we wanted to make sure that people in Darwin or in Broome or you know, in the far corners of Tasmania had the same access to this event without having to physically be in the room. It, um, 
we, we couldn't actually um, make it self-funding and it was a very expensive exercise and they came to the party and, and have underwritten it for us. And it's been absolutely vital to do that. One of the things that is absolutely key for us is not just to take it to the business community but to take it to the leaders of the future. And there is an organisation called ISEC and, and Pamela Mantaring is probably in the room. Pamela communicated with me a few months ago and um, said, look, you know, I'm from this organisation and we're really interested in CSR but we're students and we have no money and we have this leadership forum. So we've actually accessed a, quite a number of students here. Yesterday we opened our forum to students but more importantly, through Viacorp, we're actually webcasting this event and it's going to go free of charge to 50,000 students in 89 countries worldwide. So that's something to be really proud of. So on that note, I'm going to sort of finish up for a few moments. And um, I mentioned how difficult it was to actually engage media in conversation um, and get them interested in what's happening. We've had some great support from a number of people. Valerie Coo's in the room. She's written some great stuff. There's a number of people who have, but well, there's a huge amount of resistance out there. And in terms of a, a sort of a global environment, the BBC are the first major media organisation who have embedded um, CSR into their organisation. It's a very interesting story. Uh, and I know that uh, Michael's very happy to share that with anyone over the next few days. But more importantly, uh, right now, we've actually asked uh, Lord Hastings to come and share with us uh, why CSR is important and government and media. It's interesting that there is very minimal government representation here. Um, some of them are on their journey, but... Um, I do hope that we take this webcast to some of them and for those of you who have friends in media and the government, it would be terrific for you to be sharing um, some of the learnings over the last couple of days and I think particularly with what we're going to hear from, from Lord Hastings. So please join with me in welcoming Lord Michael Hastings from the Head of CSR for the BBC. Um, you've all been standing for far too long so why don't you sit down? There's lots of space up here. Just move forward and sit down. Come on, you're Australians. You can relax. Just sit down. <clears throat> well, <laughs> it's particularly fitting. Uh, uh, yeah, you, I mean, you know, in the presence of a Lord, you can take your shoes off, that's fine. <laughs> I'm very happy with that. Um, uh, <clears throat> just shortly after, uh, after I, I, I received my title a, a couple of weeks ago, I was at an event with the uh, Princess Royal, Princess Anne, and uh, she's, ch she's president of my charity in the UK. So she arrives normally with her kind of police escort and in, in the, the big Bentley and the whole thing. And for the last 10 years, I've been used to greeting her and she comes out of the car and, you know, sort of nod and so on. So I greeted her. She came out of the car and I said, Your Royal Highness. And she said, My Lord. And I thought, well, it's, <laughs> Cause it's very strange to be here in Australia, remembering that you are literally on the other side of the world to where we are in Europe. In a way, we're in the north, you're in the south. So everything is reversed. And it's kind of ironic when you go into a shopping complex here and you see Christmas trees in what is essentially your summer. And, uh, you know, to remember that actually our winter is your summer and that Christmas is still the same day, but it does feel very strange that, uh, that, that you know, the sort of images of snow-clad little uh, shores and mountains, it's all rather bizarre when you see it in this context. So I thought, given that you're Australia, maybe a way of thinking about CSR is to, is to flip the, the letters around. Instead of it being corporate social responsibility, which some people have a, a bad attitude to, why don't we just turn it around and call it RSC? And I'm going to suggest to you that maybe this is a, a different way of thinking about it. So, first of all, R, instead of standing for responsibility, in business terms, I would suggest is responsiveness. And I say responsiveness because what's happened in the global business climate is that whereas previously companies could locate themselves in a given physical location, operate there, feel safe, and think my business is secure in this environment, what media and technology have done, which David Grayson was saying to us so powerfully this morning, is spread everything on a global scale. There's no such thing as the local anymore. Everything is global. Information travels fast. So what is the global responsive environment? What do the public want 
to which business needs to respond. Second, sustainability, by which I don't mean environment. People tend to think sustainability is about environmentalism, about the trees and the shrubs and the forests and the animals. By sustainability, what I primarily mean is can you secure the growth of a business or public operation in a highly competitive world in which every business is threatened by the one next door? How can you secure sustainability? And if you can then apply the principles of environmental sustainability to match those of business sustainability, you've got effective sustainability. And thirdly, competitiveness. Because I would argue that corporate social responsibility is not about doing good or doing well. In business terms, it's about succeeding set against the competition. It's proving that you can actually deliver services more cheaply, more effectively, more responsively, more appropriately in line with global expectations so you can sustain and grow a business. Now, to answer the question, why is it important to govern? I'm going to speak primarily from a UK or European perspective. In just, well, in fact, in less than 24 hours' time, uh, tomorrow, the UK government will be kicking off in its role as president of the European Union for these six months, kicking off a conference in London over two days, which is going to address corporate social responsibility and, and the role of the European Union. And this is what the Department of Trade and Industry in London put out in their press release on the 15th of November. This event comes at a time when an increasingly important role is attributed to CSR as one way to achieve Europe's strategic Lisbon goal. For the European Union, quotes, to become, by 2010, the most competitive and dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world, capable of sustainable economic growth and with more and better jobs and greater social cohesion. For the European Union, for the British government, for the new members who will enter the European Union, for Turkey who's knocking hard on the door of the EU, coming into Europe means coming into an environment where CSR is revered, not coming into an environment where it's disregarded. Now that's not to say that business leaders in Amsterdam or Dresden or right across the complex web of European nations, sit up the minute you say the word CSR and somehow do due, due, due deference to it. But it is to say that within a social framework where competitive countries seek to compete one with the other and with the United States, with the Asian economies, and of course increasingly with China and with India, the issue of competitiveness and knowledge, and knowledge-based economy, are integrated into sustainable thinking. So this conference literally taking place tomorrow and the day after in London are intended to address those dilemmas. Also in the draft European Constitution, which was published last year, the European Union set out in clauses 3.3 and 3.4 the following ambition. A Europe of sustainable development, aiming at full employment and social progress, protection of the environment and the sustainable development of the earth, free and fair trade, eradication of poverty and protection of human rights. These are serious ambitions. These are not woolly-minded intentions. These are things to which the nations of Europe have decided that they wish to agree to. Now, the fact that the treaty is struggling in some nations to be agreed is beside the point. The foundation principles were secured by leaders of the European Union and will, in effect, form the constitution of a new European family in the course of the next decade. It's simply a matter of adjusting the terms under which the financial arrangements of the European Union are developed. But I want to go a little bit further than that and say if these issues are important to the European Union, they're important to the United Kingdom, they're important to the emerging nations of the former Eastern Bloc and to the first potentially Muslim member of the European Union, Turkey, in some period of time in the next decade, are these questions also important in the global context? Because I think there are two things that are driving the development of CSR in the wider global environment. One is, not, and not just the list of things that David gave us this morning, one is the inadequacy that is to be felt amongst the most marginalized and the poor, and the consequential impact on conflict that follows from that inadequacy. You know the figures, but let me just give them to you. 1.2 billion people are without access to clean drinking water. The same number are living on a dollar a day. 1.6 billion people are without electricity. Air pollution is estimated to cause 5% of the world's deaths every year, and in the last decade, 
approximately 2% of the world's forests were lost. Inequalities like these cause instability, and they represent a major threat to business. <laughs> business lost is companies destroyed. But worse than that, the issue of security and conflict are bound in with poverty and personal need. The British government has become obsessed, and probably rightly in the last period of time, with questions around terrorism. When the leaders of the G8 gathered in Glen Eagles in Scotland, they gathered in order to address the issues of, of Africa's long-term poverty. Within minutes of gathering, they were interrupted by suicide bombs in London. All of a sudden, the conflicts of the Middle East become the issues of the Glen Eagles leaders. So they stood together, every one of them, rigidly attempting to denounce terrorism. But behind that denunciation, the hard realization that you don't end terrorism by harder security, ever intensely clamping down on those you think are marginalized, you can't resolve it that way, although it's part and parcel of it. You have to begin a new leadership dialogue. And that dialogue has to include those who are most excluded and feel most aggrieved. Because there are factors that belie international conflict, and one of those, of course, besides issues of religion, is that of poverty and need. Another thing taking place literally in the next two days is the Doha round of talks happening in Hong Kong. They'll come together tomorrow and the day after. I want to read you just briefly a speech that Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, delivered in London two weeks ago. Just a couple of paragraphs. He said this. The Doha trade round is absolutely central to showing that the world has the capacity to confront its multilateral challenges with the necessary unity of purpose and overcome them. Trade is a metaphor for today's world. Trade increases prosperity. Prosperity gives people and nations a stake in the future. Such a stake shows how we gain by helping and not harming each other. At some point, we will have to return to the issue of UN reform and how we create the right institutional capability to handle global challenges. But in the meantime, at least let us send a clear statement of our determination to shape events and not to be overwhelmed by them. Global terrorism can be defeated, but only by the ideas of democracy, tolerance, and freedom, as well as hunting down those that murder without limit the innocent. Climate change needs economic growth to be sustainable in, the, in its environmental effects, but no agreement will be effective unless it recognizes that developing nations need to grow. Global poverty in Africa will be fought not just by aid, but by good governance, the absence of corruption, and an end to the ravages of unnecessary conflict. In a modern world, there is no security or prosperity at home unless we deal with the global challenges of conflict, terrorism, climate change, and poverty. Self-interest and mutual interest are inextricably linked. National interests can best be advanced through collective action. Calculate not just the human misery of the poor themselves. Calculate the loss, our loss, the aid, the loss of opportunity to trade, the short-term consequences of multiple conflict, the long-term consequences of the, on the attitude to the wealthy world of injustice and the abject deprivation amongst the poor. We will reap what we sow. We will live with what we do not act to change. Now, don't tell me for a minute that those issues of climate change, terrorism, poverty, and conflict are not issues in Australia, because they are. So why is it important to government? As government thinks increasingly about the role it plays in wider global issues, not just the immediate defense of the nation state and its limited boundaries, but because the issues that affect so much the security of those boundaries do not have limitations. They spread by technology, they spread by migration, they spread by international presence, they spread through global goods. All of these things, particularly on the most marginalized and the poor, require solutions. When I left the UK at the, at the weekend, the big news was as follows. All night drinking and secure pensions. Two complicated issues, both costly. One to do with the passions of the young to drink away the night and sick themselves up and need the support of the health services. The other to do with the rights of workers. Why were these two things occupying the news agenda? 
Because the news agenda in the United Kingdom, the same as in much of the rest of the European, is associated most closely with social pressures. And who is driving this change process? Because behind the all-night drinking issue lies the responsibility of the drinks industries. And behind the drinks industries lies those who own the rights to the products. And associated with pensions are, of course, those who invest the funds, but more importantly, the companies and organizations who back the pension system. When I came to Australia on Tuesday, and I turned on the news, of course, BBC World, what else? But I turned on the news, <clears throat> I discovered that there were two dominant headlines to be received here. One was the Canadian Conference on Climate Change, and the second was the speech by the British Prime Minister Tony Blair on nuclear energy and renewable sustainable energy sources. You see, these issues which we would associate with corporate social responsibility are now the issues of government. They are the issues of governance. They are the issues of business. They are the issues of competitiveness. They are the issues of everyday community activity. They are the issues of security and well-being. They are the issues of safety and the sense of the ability to move from one place to another without permanent interruption to your life. The British Chancellor Gordon Brown in 2004 said this. He said, corporate social responsibility today goes far beyond the old philanthropy of the past. And it's important to say that, that, that you don't develop a mindset that CSR is just about money and the giving thereof. He said, it goes beyond philanthropy, donating money to good causes. Instead, it's an all-year-round responsibility, an all-year-round responsibility that companies accept for the environment around them, for the best working practices, for their engagement in their local communities, for their recognition that brand names depend not just on quality, price, and uniqueness, but on how cumulatively they interact with the company's workforce, community, and environment. We need now to move towards a challenging measure of corporate social responsibility where we judge results not just by the input, but by its outcomes, the difference we make to the world in which we live, and the contribution we make to poverty reduction. At the heart of all of that is the most intangible of all business assets, the asset of trust. In a global business environment, what you cannot absolutely secure, but you can begin to measure, but you most essentially need is the trust and confidence of your customers, whether they're corporate or individual. None of those things can be achieved in the long term by a flippant and dismissive attitude to any of these aspects of responsiveness, sustainability, or competitiveness. You see, business leadership is needed to deal with the macro problems, CO2, energy, global warming, energy supply, but also the micro issues of that, my carbon footprint, my impact through recycling the products I have in my home, my purchasing of fair trade, my commitment to fair employment, my asset investment, i.e people, what I do to back people who deliver those services. All of these things are now an integrated whole and cannot be dismissed or divided any longer. I want to move on just very briefly to taking the second part of it, which is the role of the media. Having addressed the question of government because these things are now unavoidable and beyond any opportunity to be avoided, what is the responsibility of the media? We've moved into a global context where we're so media sensitive and frenzied by knowledge that media triggers will deliver that overwhelming change of either panic and fear or of confidence and well-being. On the plane here, I watched Aldous Huxley's War of the World film. Of course, it tells the story of something that hasn't yet happened. But as you begin to watch War of the Worlds, what you realize is not that the invasion in this planet will probably realistically ever come from those men from outside. But wherever you are in an insecure environment, you feel invaded by the person who damages your sense of personal security and well-being. Those changes are now very real for the wealthy who previously thought that was only the domain of the poor. We are invaded by those who affect us. But knowledge spreads that sense of fear and panic. It also can at the same time, and should do, spread a sense of well-being. What have we done in the BBC? Well, we first of all, defined what we meant by CSR. And let me just read you a little bit of that. I'm going to entertain you in the, min in the minute with a DVD, so don't worry, you're not just listening to words for the whole time. But let me just read you what the BBC's core mission is. 
The BBC's core mission is to enrich people's lives. That's the statement of principle enshrined in not just in our, in our charter, but also in the purposes for which we exist, to enrich people's lives with programs and services which inform, educate, and entertain. In line with this, and this is the statement agreed by the BBC's executive and governors, the BBC aims to be a responsible corporate citizen acting in the public interest to strengthen and enrich communities across the UK and internationally. To us, corporate social responsibility means living our values with integrity and ethical consistency towards our people, our audiences, our business suppliers, and the communities we operate in to maintain their faith or their trust in the BBC. The BBC's social impact will be most evident through fulfilling our public service duties and through our environmental, ethical, charitable, and community commitments. See, when you think about the media as a whole, the first thing that most people think is probably summed up by this quote from Erwin Knoll, who says this, everything you read in the newspaper is absolutely true, except for the rare story of which you happen to have first-hand knowledge. <laughs> Does that resonate? When you really know about something, and you read the record of it, you're amazed at how distorted the record is. Somehow that gives you an ingrained sense of disquiet. Well, the man of uh, Alex Tocqueville said in 1805, the public will always believe a simple lie rather than a complex truth. So much of the media's progress has relied on its capacity to feed us simplicity and to deny us complexity because we're considered to be too ill-equipped to deal with it. Part of the BBC's responsibility is to make sure that complexity is continuously explained in the simplest ways that engages the public in then responding to find solutions. So take a look in a second now at what Rod Stewart made of this. You know Rod Stewart? Huh? <laughs> Two Fridays ago. Uh, I'm sorry, you said I'm showing you brilliant. I'm here because my film was on, because my sister's disabled, and I helped take care of her. Eight million people watched seven hours of live television Friday two weeks ago. Elton John, Rod Stewart, Madonna, a host of glittering international stars giving their time free, raising 17.25 million on the night, which turns in the next six months into about 35 million pounds. In the last 25 years, 400 million pounds raised and given to disadvantaged children in the United Kingdom suffering a variety of conditions. For the BBC, it's one of the biggest audience nights of the year. In fact, it's the highest audience Friday, apart from the Comic Relief Friday in March that the BBC has. It delivers audience impact, social value, 
understanding of issues, huge resources raised, and an appreciation of confidence and trust in the organization that associates the BBC with today's dilemmas. Because it's associated with today's dilemmas, but today's personalities, it positions the BBC as an answer as compared to a purveyor of the problems. That's what we mean by public value in an organization like the BBC. Its future is dependent on associating the British public with an ambition which is about changing society. The government's defined the purposes of the BBC for the next 10 years of its charter future as sustaining citizenship and delivering social cohesion. Those are high and lofty ambitions, but they must have practical expressions. And raising funding in this measure and in many associated with it, in the course of the average year, we raise in, a, in, in the region of 100 to 120 million pounds for charitable organizations in the United Kingdom. We do that, and I'm not just the United Kingdom, sorry, as well with the Comet Relief Model for international charities, mainly in Africa. We do that because public confidence in the BBC is associated with its values, but also with trusting the record of the organization in delivering fair, accurate, impartial news and programs of consistent value. But this is what the Director General of the BBC describes as its foundation purpose. He says this, the BBC's founders believe that broadcasting could make the world a better place. Public intervention would ensure that, the, that broadcasting's astonishing creative power to enrich individuals with knowledge, culture, and information about their world, to build more cohesive communities, to engage the people of the UK and the whole globe in a new conversation about who we are and where we're going, will be put to work to the sole benefit of the public. See, for the BBC and our challenges for the rest of the media who we seek to lead, media has the opportunity not just to question nor to, or just to critique or to be even cynical, but it has the opportunity to deliver integrity and trust and a sense of social well-being. So the nation can smile and believe that it's involved in resolution and solution, not just in analysis and pressure. Just to give you one more example of the leadership we've attempted to take. In the last two weeks, we published our annual corporate responsibility review. In the back of it, we included a specific example of a project we kicked off exactly a year ago called BBC World Class. It was an ambitious attempt to link schools in the United Kingdom through the BBC website with schools in Africa across the continent in a year in which the G8 nations would focus on Africa and the BBC would focus on Africa. We set ourselves the ambition of linking 1,000 schools in Africa with 1,000 schools in the United Kingdom. By the time we'd actually reached the BBC Africa season in June of this year, we'd already passed 2,000 schools. As of last week, we have 3,000 schools now in the United Kingdom linked to 3,000 schools across the continent of Africa. And what are they doing? Teachers and children are sharing curriculum and ideas. They're exchanging their cultures. They're appreciating one another. None of this is producing television or making radio. This is intended to use the power of the web through a trusted medium internet source, the BBC brand, to allow people to exchange their lives with each other and build a cohesive international community. That's part of delivering public value on the global stage. But then the earthquake in Pakistan happened. And BBC World Class was asked, could you switch your attention from Africa to Pakistan? There are many large Pakistani communities in the United Kingdom. They would love to know what children associated with their own communities and their families in Pakistan are doing. How are they faring? So World Class with the British Council opened up the window to create the same in Islamabad. 150 schools were twinned within a week, which then meant that BBC News was able to go and film the twinning relationship between the two sets of schools in Islamabad through the north of Pakistan and those in the United Kingdom, which provided program material for our breakfast shows and our news programs. You see, doing this kind of thing doesn't have to lead ultimately to output and to content. But what it must lead to is a sense of cohesive and positive value. I want to read you just lastly on this section a quote from the, the last chairman of the BBC, Gavin Davis, um, who, as you, some of you remember, was also chief economist of Goldman Sachs, who said this, <clears throat> the BBC has no choice but to be responsive to the wishes of our audience. Vastly increased competition is seen to that. And apart from people's stringent demands on the BBC as a broadcaster, Licensed payers are increasingly building an ethical and moral dimension to their views of the BBC as an organization. 
They expect the BBC to attain the highest standards of corporate behavior. There's little doubt that if we fail to live up to these standards as a corporate entity, then we will lose people's trust in us as a program maker. And the trust of our audiences is the most important commodity we possess. I want just briefly to give you one or two quick and final examples. On the plane here, I was reading a, a magazine which was thrust into my hand at the end of last week. It includes two fascinating examples of how this issue of responsiveness, sustainability, and competitiveness are applied. Take the issue of gambling and gaming laws. I know it's, a, it's an issue affecting Australia at the moment. We have a national lottery in the UK. It's run by a company called Camelot. Camelot sells tickets in the region of 4.6 billion pounds a year. Its primary ambition in the sale of tickets is not to make a profit for Camelot, although it does so. It is that it should raise money for good causes in the United Kingdom. For the 2012 uh, Olympic Games in London, roughly 25% of the cost of the Olympic Games will be bought extensively by lottery tickets. But what Camelot have done is attempted to introduce a risk, a risk matrix into their management tool in order that what they can do is alleviate the problem of young people engaged in gambling. Now, you'd think for a commercial profit-orientated organization, the one thing you'd most want to do is to get more people to play the game. The more people you get to play the game, the higher level of return and the greater your own profits. Introducing a risk matrix where they test out with focus groups whether certain games are going to attract people below the age of 18 or below the age of 16 because they rate the different games in particular ways. Whether those are going to be too risky and too attractive has meant that the organization Camelot as a business has dropped many areas of gaming which in the last year cost them 1.5 million pounds in profit. But what it has resulted in is higher levels of public confidence in the Camelot brand and higher appreciation of their value in running the lottery. As a consequence to that, the opportunity for Camelot to continue to run the, lot, the national lottery in the United Kingdom, which is now reckoned to be probably one of the most successful in the world, will more than likely continue when their license renewal comes forward. They've also introduced a mechanism whereby they send out uh, young people who look like 16-year-olds but are actually not 16-year-olds to go into shops and attempt to purchase the tickets. As a result of doing Operation Child, as they call it, they've, able to stop, they've been roughly able to stop around about 10,000 shops from selling tickets where they should not have otherwise done so to minors. So the rate of shoppers who were previously selling to minors, which was at 74% in 1999, is now at 90% of those who are not selling, selling to minors. All of this has resulted in increased credit to the organization and a license to operate. The second example I want to give you is an example which I found uh, to be completely, uh, completely relevant to your situation here in Australia, which is Rio Tinto, and I know one, of you, one or two of you are aware of this. You know Rio Tinto is a large mining operation, a turnover of $4.4 billion, set a process up uh, with the Argyle Mine Company in East Kimberley in order to uh, deliver new rights for the indigenous population who'd lived in the area for the last 40,000 years. In short, what they did was to open up a new dialogue to the indigenous population about their land rights. Now, opening up a dialogue like that is inevitably going to lead, you so you'd think, in the loss of land rights and opportunities for the company. But what it resulted in was not just a comprehensive apology from the company itself, from Rio Tinto and its senior executives, but also from Argyle Diamonds, who apologized for previous incursions into traditional land, land and to land rights, and for the abuses which the company had used against people who worked in the area. It also ended up in a new contract of partnership and reconciliation be between the two, health initiatives and social care programs from the company towards those who are working in its area. As a consequence of that, local people have said they now wish the Diamond Company to open up new mining extraction opportunities and to extend its license for the further period that would give it at least a further 20 to 25 years beyond when the current mines will operate. The consequence of applying social responsibility principles in a profitable organization has, although it took the hard bite of not just the, the swallow of integrity and the potential loss of respect as a result of doing so, has resulted instead in a reconciliation with local people, an advance of those local people, and the integrity of local land rights being protected, and the further extension of a license. So is this stuff about competitiveness or not? absolutely beyond dispute and beyond argument. 
I want to come back just very quickly and lastly to the overriding principles of how you get this stuff done. The reason you get this stuff done is because at the heart of who you are as an individual and who you are as an organization, your purpose is not about the shareholder. The shareholder and the profit maker has value. Ultimately, in a global environment, the stakeholder is the primary person. The stakeholder will put you in business or throw you out. Reputation will either make you thrive or kill you off. But more than anything else, for those who work with you and those that you impact in any business environment, leadership must enable you to deliver a socially cohesive community from which those most basic of things matter, your own sense of well-being and confidence, the security of your children to go anywhere on the globe and feel safe, the security and confidence of your communities to operate without interference, and the sense that the world is a just and a fair environment. In that place, competitive, sustainable, responsive social responsibility delivers the best outcomes. Thank you.